You're listening to Nocturne. I'm Vanessa Lowe. Light has different colors. It can either be really cool, so 5000K light is really cool, or it can be really warm, like 2700, and now the industry is going down to 2200K. I'm not sure if you want me to explain color temperature. That's Jane Slade. She's a lighting designer and researcher. But the way that it works is that it's correlated color temperature. So if you think of a carbon-based black body, like a log, in a fire, Well, the embers at the bottom of the fire are that bright orange. Well, that's always the same temperature. So that's about a thousand degrees Kelvin. And then the white flame coming off the log is about 2,700 degrees Kelvin. And then the bluest flame, which was the hottest, is 5,000 degrees Kelvin. So when we talk about light color in the lighting industry, it's really correlated light color to that black body because it's a constant. So 5000K light was the initial color choice for all original LED installations because it's the most efficient. 2700 is less efficient. You'll get less lumens per watt. So when the industry was converting to LEDs, we initially chose very blue light, which as it turned out is deeply impactful to all living things. So we've started to come down in color temperature from say 5,000 to 3,500 to 3,000. And now we're really starting to see that people are starting to install 2,700 and now 2,200 with that beautiful warm glow. And that brings us closer to what high pressure and low pressure sodium fixtures looked like back in the day. And a lot of people have a lot of nostalgia for the look and feel of those yellowish lights. That detailed knowledge of the particulars of light is part and parcel of Jane's day job, working for an agency that represents outdoor lighting manufacturers. We work with municipalities to bring lighting into cities and outdoor spaces. We do a lot of streetscape projects where we help cities define what the style of lighting that they need is, how much light to deliver. We often work with landscape architects, lighting consultants, designers, architects to bring lighting into projects. And where I come in is really trying to be offering tools to light more sustainably. Before Jane became a lighting designer, she got a master's degree in interior design. In her interior design work on commercial projects, she was struck by the environmentally unfriendly materials that were routinely used and then discarded. So often these projects are up for five years and then there's a change and somehow it gets ripped out. And where do all of these building materials go? They go in landfills. So I really started to think about that. She thought about it to the point of getting a grant to go to India, where she researched the recycling economy there and created an art installation consisting of over 2,000 plastic bottles, which she turned into lighting fixtures. There was one Buckminster Fuller ball made out of Pepsi bottles. There was another really long cylinder with just the threads that were melted into this mesh metal core. I did teardrops of sadness and jewels of desire. So there were different lighting fixtures that I designed and then we curated them to overall make a comment about our use of plastic in the world. Jane realized that her true passion lay not in interior design, but in lighting. It didn't take long, though, for her to notice the environmental problems plaguing that field as well. I realized that having been an interior designer and waking up to our use of materials, and then having worked in the lighting industry and waking up to our use of light, that there's something in me that's very protective of our environment. And so it's sort of the second design industry that I've been in where I've been fairly disappointed with how the environment is being treated. Until fairly recently, someone in the lighting industry would be concerned primarily with adding light. It's a pretty new phenomenon to have outdoor lighting designers strongly focused on when and where light should not be. In around 2016, I started to think of The fact that light was becoming extremely pervasive. 
I just intuitively sensed we were overdosing. Light was always getting brighter. LEDs really have changed how we think of light and how we actually almost abuse light because the energy is so free and easy to use. I was working for a manufacturer and we were coming up with 1000 watt LED fixtures, which is crazy because a thousand watts in an LED is like 4,000 watts in another type of light source. So things were getting brighter and brighter and it felt very unsustainable to me. I was the keynote speaker for an, a sustainability organization here in Boston and I wanted to talk about how light impacts humans. Jane's work and study around light had led her to become acutely aware of what we lose as things become brighter and the growing and pervasive experience that she calls starving for darkness. This framework of starving for darkness became a lens for how I see the world, and it has totally changed the trajectory of my career. So while I started this work by working in the lighting industry, now I am a researcher of the impacts of darkness on all living things, because I realized that we were missing such an important piece of the balance of light and darkness. Unfortunately, the lighting industry suffers from this proverb, which is if I have a hammer, everything is a nail. But I think there's gonna be a time where we really start to cultivate darkness and bring it into our projects wholeheartedly. And that's why in my writing, I've suggested that as designers of light, that we create two plans, a lighting design plan and a darkness design plan. Because if we don't offer the darkness design plan, then we're just relying on happenstance that it happens. And more often than not, the darkness is lost. Without care and consideration, it's easy for outdoor areas to be overlit, with bright bluish light glaring up into the sky, obstructing views of the stars, interfering with darkness vital to animal survival, and even inadvertently creating dangerous environments for humans. This is why, when Jane is not actively working on the practical applications of outdoor lighting, she can often be found shouting from the Instagram mountaintop under the handle Anatomy of Night. That's where she posts her concise, poignant thoughts on the vital importance of night and darkness. Things like, there is an infinity waiting when we turn out the lights. Natural darkness is a gateway to the present moment. And night vision is a necessary way of seeing. Also, starlight is a birthright. These are seemingly strange pronouncements for someone who designs lighting for a living. But Jane has joined the growing band of what I like to call darkness evangelists. She calls herself a dark sky defender. Being a dark sky defender means that I am continually trying to think of ways to bring back darkness to all living things and to find a way to create a beautiful balance where we actually revere this time on the planet. The planet shares night and day. They are integral parts of the planetary experience. And I, I really want to show people that it can be beautiful, that it can create beautiful moments and experiences, and that it's also very needed for our health and well-being. I don't think that I've invented darkness. I think that I am a conduit to help bring back darkness because darkness is an age-old medicine that humans have been experiencing for our entire time on this planet all living things and so for me being a dark sky defender is doing the meditation and the writing and the work to try and remember what it is that we're all missing so that i can remind my fellow living things of how to experience night. When Jane thinks about integrating darkness and light in design, she takes inspiration from nature. I love the lighting that happens in forests because it is an unapologetic combination of light and darkness. When you see the mix of light and darkness on a forest floor, it is constant head-turning ethereal moments. And those moments are possible because of the shade of the trees and of the landscape. 
And so it really is a very beautiful natural example of when we don't experience solely brightness, how beautiful the combination of light and dark can really be. Jane's expertise in lighting gives her a unique perspective from which to protect the darkness. My mission with Anatomy of Night is to show not just lighting people, not just my own industry, but that for everyone, there is beauty to be gained by having dimmer and darker experiences. Her writing delves into the layers of darkness's impact. There's what darkness means to her personally. Darkness is a time when I can reconnect to myself. It is an offering from the natural world that allows me to say it's okay to now focus in on myself and what my wants, needs, and wishes are. Then there's what darkness represents for humans in general. Darkness offers humans a moment for rest and recovery. And it's funny for me because I think that no one would turn down time for rest and recovery if we called it that. But we are so light addicted that it feels like we're being deprived, but I think we've forgotten what we're missing. So darkness is really an opportunity to reconnect and to come to a slower, quieter feeling of perceiving the world. And then there is what a true dark night is to the non-human world. Darkness is a birthright for the natural world. And we have taken our earthly experience and changed it over the last hundred or so years in ways that we will not understand perhaps for decades of what the impacts are. But darkness is absolutely vital for the normal functioning of many, many species. The conversation when I came upon this work was about the human loss, the loss of the night sky for our thinking and our philosophy and our understanding of our place in this universe. But no one was really talking about the wildlife loss. And for wildlife, darkness is a point of survival. It is absolutely necessary. And really, without wildlife health, there is no human health. Past episodes of Nocturne have touched on many of the health effects of light pollution. And there are many negative effects, to be sure. But it's the internal, psychological, and even spiritual effects of overlighting that Jane is drawn to explore. I realized that something much deeper was happening when we were missing the night sky. It wasn't just, you know, stargazing with our hands on our hips and being like, wow, that's, that's a really cool constellation. And, you know, I wonder what it's all about. There is something much deeper that we're missing, and that's the reflection of darkness. Uh, the reflection that darkness offers us in our lives to be able to understand our lives better. It's not just a loss of stargazing. It's a loss of self-gazing. I think this is a funny analogy, but it's, you know, in the age of the pandemic, we've all jumped online and now we do all these video calls. And I actually really miss the phone because I think that there is something much more intuitive about that connection. I think we can get lost in the visual. And so our eyes are really taking in light and information for our brains to perceive the world. And if we're constantly in brightness, if we're constantly in the on that I am a receiver of information, then we never get to actually reflect and take information in internally. So the way that I describe this is that light draws our awareness outside of our bodies and darkness draws our awareness within. When we experience darkness, I feel like it blurs the boundaries of self. I do think that the gaze and our focus is brought inward, but at the same time, I don't see my body, I don't see the walls, and I feel like it kind of connects me to this core place inside of me. And at the same time, we can connect to one another on a more human level. So while we've been talking here, it's getting dimmer and dimmer, and it really does change how I think and how I experience 
our conversation and our connection. And I honestly wish that we could be in the same dim space together because I think there's something very bonding about that. We are always in bright spaces with people, but when the lights get dimmer, you start to connect in different ways. While Jane works to improve the institutional use of outdoor lighting to be more conducive to health and well-being, she's also discovered another way to try to affect change, and that's with language. She's actually invented a whole new word for the study of darkness. Tenebrosology is named from the Latin tenebri, tenebris, which is darkness. And I wanted to formalize the study of natural darkness because I feel as if it needs its own structure and support around it so that people can know that this is worth pursuing. There's just so much to understand of what darkness actually does for our minds and bodies of all living things that I felt we really needed to start from a place of darkness and not talk about darkness as just an absence of light because I think that doesn't do it justice. And if darkness is half of the planetary experience, but we only study from the starting place of illumination, then we'll never fully understand the value of darkness. We also have to give it the respect to start from the place of darkness. In addition to centering darkness in conversation, Jane uses language to try to rebrand it. There's an initial gut reaction that people have to darkness now as being either boring or scary. And it doesn't have to be that way. Darkness is a beautiful asset to our lives. And when I say darkness, I mean more natural darkness, where we really enjoy these moments of dimmer lights in the human experience and don't associate darkness with just being a lack of light or a lack of screens. I've never heard of anyone coming away from a fireside saying, oh, I'm really stressed out. I want to continue to develop language that is supportive of darkness, where it really reminds people of moments where there has been great beauty that has been experienced in darkness. Right now, Jane is focused on framing darkness in more positive terms in the way she talks and writes about it. However, the fact still exists that there aren't many words pertaining to darkness that are generally perceived as positive. Quite the opposite, in fact. But Jane sees this changing along with our perception. I think when people start to embrace darkness as something really beautiful, that language is going to naturally come through the people. But for now, the words that I come up with are soft, dimmer. I wrote an article entitled The Language of Darkness. And in that, I really wanted to describe that we aren't talking about darkness in a way that is flattering. We talk about it only in ways that are very limiting. So I think that other ways of talking about it are bringing in rituals, so firesides, bringing in the idea that we could actually lower the lights and experience a different way of connecting to one another, a different way of having a conversation. So I want to embrace a new language by offering new ways of experiencing darkness, because I don't think the words alone will do it. I think it's more about inviting people into spaces that are dimmer and really showing that it isn't a loss, it's a gain in experience. Jane has used this creative thinking about language to talk in a new way about the biggest threat to darkness. I was thinking about the term light pollution and I thought, you know, that's a really terrible way of describing it because when we talk about air pollution, the air is being polluted or water pollution, the water is being polluted. But when we talk about light pollution, light is the polluting factor. So it's very interesting to call it that because actually light is very desirable. People like light. We're attracted to the the bright flashy objects. Um, we, we too are like moths to a flame. So it's not a great sell for the problem because we're selling it with this glitzy 
idea. And so I recently wrote that I thought better terms for it would be night pollution, sleep pollution, ease pollution, restoration pollution, because that's really what light at night is doing, is that it's impacting how we are able to rest and recover and how animals rest and recover, as well as how nocturnal animals live on this planet. So it's not a great way of describing it, and it also doesn't issue alarm. The problem is most people don't think of light pollution as a problem. They think of it as a nuisance, but it's actually a ghastly aspect of climate change that nobody's paying attention to. There are many ways to address what we call light pollution, involving color temperature, brightness, timing of lighting, directionality. The International Dark Sky Association has good guidelines for how to light sustainably. If we were just to implement dark sky compliance specifications, we would be in such a better position. I think people don't realize the extent that we have been tolerating this glare and obstruction of darkness. There's so much low-hanging fruit that we could reclaim. I've seen beautiful lighting design projects. One was done by a firm, Sladen Feinstein. This is a project on Cape Cod, and they actually kept these bollards really low on a wooden walkway. And there's this image of the sky up above and then this wooden walkway. And the bollards are probably 12 inches tall. And they kept the lights really low to the ground, really low in intensity and really warm. And when you see this image, you see this delicate light on the footpath but the full gradient of the sky is still open to your retina because our retinas actually can be adapted to light and darkness. So I could actually have my lower part of my retina adapted to the footpath, but still allow my upper part of my retina to be adapted to the changing gradient of the sky so that they don't compete. And so that's a moment for me in lighting design where you really see the ability to light for human activity while maintaining awe in the landscape. The way that you could ruin that is by putting pole lights up and having those lights actually not be dark sky compliant and blow out the sky. And actually that would make everything feel really dark because everything would feel dark in comparison to the overly blown out lights. So there are ways that we could actually craft light with light levels and where we're putting the light that still allow us access to the night. The lighting industry has been moving toward more sustainability on the whole. And there are pockets of enlightenment in the industry about the need to preserve darkness. But the need for dark sky defenders is ongoing. There are a lot of organizations that want to continue selling lighting products and don't want to consider that darkness also is a part of this process. And unfortunately, money is often a driving factor and it has not helped us with the 2% year over year increase in light pollution that we're experiencing. So Jane is shouting from the mountaintops and trying to convert one person at a time. Anything she can do to help save this thing she holds dear. I recently had a designer ask me after one of my presentations, he said, I work on a lot of projects in a light polluted city in Asia, and that city absolutely loves all of this crazy color changing lighting. How could I ever convince someone that that wouldn't be the way to go? And I said, well, imagine yourself on a roof deck in that city and imagine looking up at all of the light pollution. Or imagine looking up at the majesty of the night sky. And he stopped and he said, wow, I realize now what you are saying, which is that no light installation could ever be as beautiful as the night sky. The beauty of natural darkness is hugely important for sure. But in the glare of endless stimuli and information, its value goes way beyond beauty. I think it's never been more critical to find and cultivate darkness in our lives and to understand that the stars are light enough. Of course, Jane is a lighting designer, so she's not suggesting that we live our lives entirely in darkness. She maintains we should use lighting where necessary in responsible ways that enhance beauty and visibility. 
But she also believes we should challenge the assumption that more light means more overall illumination. And so what I mean by that is that the stars are light enough to foster understanding, to build a deeper sense of self, to have a more meaningful connection to other people, that there's a dimmer way of experiencing this planet that also offers other ways of perceiving relationships with ourselves, with others, and with wildlife. You've been listening to Nocturne. I'm Vanessa Lowe. Nocturne is produced by me and was created by myself and Kent Sparling, who also composed the theme music and all the other music in this episode. You can find Jane Slate on Instagram at Anatomy of Night, and her website is anatomyofnight.com. Thank you to everyone who supports Nocturne on Patreon and PayPal. I know that it isn't always easy, and I'm profoundly grateful for any help, large or small. You keep the show going. If you'd like to contribute, please go to nocturnepodcast.org slash support. Also, please keep those emails and other messages coming. A lot of you have reached out lately, and I love hearing from you. Also, if you have a story you think would make a good episode, please let me know at vanessa at nocturnepodcast.org. Till next time, be well, and thanks for listening. <laughs>